Yeah, g'day, and welcome back to this, the fifth and last installment of my five-part trilogy on the overhaul of my dual gearbox. You know, one thing that makes a dual saw so fantastic is the gearbox. That gearbox variator combination leads to a speed range of about 100 to 1. So I really want to take advantage of that speed range of this beautiful 1957 Dual 16 SFP. Now just a quick recap for any of you that might have missed the early parts of the series. John from New York, yep, I'm looking at you. You need to go back and watch them. Input shaft can either be a one-to-one -to, -one to the output shaft or the back gear is uh, input shaft down through the lay shaft back up and out. The input shaft supported by two bearings but the output shaft just gets one and an interstage bushing. And that's slogged out, released a woodruff key which got munched between two gears and a gear tooth lost. So for years I had the gearbox bypassed with just a straight through shaft and ran the thing only in high gear, using it just for wood and aluminium. But then, a super generous gentleman from Malta called Luke made me a replacement gear set, which I promptly destroyed with shitty home heat treatment. Luckily though, Luke's seen enough of my videos to know that was quite likely to happen, so he actually made me two sets. And then another generous gentleman, Emil, in Romania, said, send me the second set and I'll get them plasma I tried it. Mail time. Oh, I know what this is. Let's come back in from Romania. Plasma nitrided parts. They have a very cool look to them. They're sort of slightly silvery looking now, huh? But wait, there's more. Oh cool, I find 20 millimeter is like the most used material in the shop for all sorts of bits and pieces. So thanks very much Emil, that's awesome. Oh nice, some inserts, nice little, little insert mill to go with it. Thanks for the Loctite, that's super glue, cool. Always need super glue, thanks a lot. Oh wow, now that's a decent size end mill. I generally have a pretty high consumption of 10 millimeter end mills, so that's brilliant. Thanks very much. Nice, 10 millimeter ball end, they always come in handy. 10 millimeter carbide, cool. So everybody, please zip straight down into the comments section and say a big thank you from all of us to Emil for getting these parts heat treated for me. This is brilliant, thank you. First up, got a couple of minor side jobs. Right, now before I can start installing this, I need to sort out this bearing. So this is the interstage bearing. I just need to polish this to a nice finish. It's pretty good already. Okay, so what does this run out look like? Next to nothing there. Yeah, so it's down at about one one hundredth of a millimeter. This surface was polished before it went for heat treatment, so it shouldn't take much to repolish it. So that end, 398, and the other end's the same. So I took 8 microns off to polish it up, and have about a 1 micron taper. That's good enough. Right, with that done, side job number 2 is putting in the matching bushing. Hole for the bearing, 24. Too big. Need to turn this down a bit. Plus it's going to need a hole in it at the end anyway, so it's probably easiest if I just whack a hole through it now and use the mandrel to turn the outside.
Right, nothing special as a mandrel, just a bit of all thread. At this stage the concentricity is not important. I'll just take this down to an interference fit of 24 millimeters, press it in and then bore out the center concentric. Aiming for 24 millimeters, bang on. I think I'll leave it at that. It's supposed to be quite a tight interference fit. It's not taking as much force as I would have expected. You can see here the problem with trying to dial this in on a plain bearing machine. Because I haven't warmed up the bearing yet, each time I move it, it rides up on the oil film and then settles back down. So I'm just going to start up the spindle, leave it running for about 5-10 minutes just to warm it up. Nope, still definitely get that effect. Let's just set it up to run nice and parallel. I'm not concentric with this with the lathe spindle at the moment. Just the high point there. I'm gonna say that's about as good as I can get it. Let's go back and recheck the other end. Okay, now we're out here. Right, well I spent about an hour trying to get perfect concentricity in both locations and this is as good as I came up with. So I've got a total indicated run out here of maybe four or five ten thousandth of an inch and a total indicated run out here of one and a half hundredths of a millimeter. Each time I got one of them closer, I ended up with the other one diverging further apart, so I'll take that. I really don't know enough about this bearing to know what its perfect clearance would be. Plain bearings, it's dependent on RPM, viscosity of the oil, things like that. So I'm just going to go for a rough guess of one thou per inch is kind of a good rule of thumb for clearance, what I've looked on the internet. So my one thou clearance would mean I'm aiming for 18.8. 4-1. Let's see how close I can hit that. I'm stuck with the limitations of trying to do, do the measurements with a bore gauge. As I get close I'll probably take multiple measurements and average them. You know, I used to have a really crappy set of bore gauges. They were basically useless. They had no repeatability in their locking point and therefore you just couldn't use them to get repeatable measurements. Luckily my dad gave me this Mitutoya set and they're really quite nice to use. Ball gauges are never the easiest. I find it very hard to get repeatability closer than about 1000 by using averaging. So I should now be two tenths of a millimeter under, actually 21 hundredths. Okay that cut went deeper than expected. So now I've only got eight one hundredths to go. Question now is do I sneak up on it in two very light cuts of four one hundredths or do I go straight to the eight one hundredths? 
this cuts quite nicely, so I think I'll just do two cuts of four one hundredths. Okay, so that's now nominal to the shaft. So do I take another shot at it to open that clearance a little? So although my bore gauge measurements say that this is basically a transitional fit and should be very tight, in actual fact, the way these slide together, I'm guessing this is probably the clearance that I was aiming for. So I'll stop there. Cool, let's start stuffing that gearbox. Ah, not so fast. The next job is to make up Woodruff keys to replace the one that got scoffed and the other one, which is really heavily worn. So this key is like three quarter inch diameter and rather than making it to the standard, I'll use my gauge block set to work out exactly which, which thickness I need. 0.88, how does that look? Yeah, that, should, that should retain the key nicely. Let's check they're both the same. 4.88 9, 2, 3 So that was a cut at 19.5 That's about as accurately set as that dial will go and now we're aiming for 19.05. All right, feed in 45. That's 10, 20, 30, 40, and a bit. Hmm, okay. Cut over size. I think I'll take that last five one hundredths off with sandpaper, because I don't think I'll get a nice surface finish if I try and cut it. Right, to get the right depth of cut, I'm going to need a little touch off here. Come off the part, and then I need to move over. 6.88. What the hell's happening there? That doesn't seem like a reliable reading. I'm getting movement without needle movement. Luckily, in addition to making those gears for me, my mate Luke also gave me about a gazillion different gauges. So I can find another one, also with a long travel, and use that instead. One, two, three, four, five, six and a half, six, 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 seven, six, eight, six, nine, we'll go seven millimeters. That'll give me a bit over a tenth to clean off. That's cutting so poorly, I must be slightly high on the cutting tool. Drop it down by a very small amount. That really is cutting poorly. I think I'll just uh, give those edges a slight chamfer. Right, before I break that parting tool, I'll just finish this off with a hacksaw. On previous uses of this hacksaw, people have pointed out that this blade seems a bit loose and that I should tighten it. Unfortunately, I think the frame on this has become stretched because that's as tight as it goes. Maybe I'll try putting a shim in here, see if that works. Right, for a precision job like this, I'm going to shim it with a bit of good Austrian beer can. I think this was Stiegel, Stieglitz, I don't know, something like that. Well, if that works, that gives me another side project. Sounds better. Didn't sharpen the blade at all. Let's put on a new one. Ah, that's much better. This one's got teeth that cut.
I'm not sure what steel I'm using here, but it seems quite beastly. When you're using a hacksaw, make sure you use full length strokes. If you paid for all the teeth, you might as well use them all. Right, just flipped over to collets to face these things to width. First, just do a clean up cut. I couldn't get such a tiny part to run true in a normal collet. Now for the poly, I've got a few duplicate or oddball sort of collets. And what I'll do, yeah, one like this. I'll just bore out a bit of that for a nice shoulder to sit that in and grip it while I face it. finish them off, I've locked the saddle down. I've set the top slide along the way so I can just dial in direct depth. And I've switched over to a highly positive rake insert designed for aluminium parts. And I'll use that to take the final fine cuts. Still not quite flat, I'll just go and measure it. Another 0.14 on the skinniest bit. I was going to split the two woodruff keys out of the blank with my hacksaw, but unfortunately it looks like the adjuster nut inside is not working anymore, kind of binding up, so... I could set up the mill and mill those down that last millimetre, but I think I'll just whack them with a file. Shouldn't take long. Upper tolerance is 7.9 five and the lower tolerance is 7.82 okay so that's the first one in tolerance with the keys now made now I can start assembly well not so fast by the way, these aren't the keys I just made. They go somewhere else. They're slightly looser, so they're easy for trial assembly. Okay, so this is the drive dog for selecting between the two gears. Unfortunately, on one side, the hooks for driving the matching part are nice and sharp with a nice angle. But on the other side, they're pretty heavily worn with rounded shoulders. I'm looking at this thinking, this is just gonna jump out of gear, isn't it? So maybe I should address them as well. What's another side job? Setting up a tool and cutter grinder kind of reminds me a bit of playing with Meccano or Lego when I was a kid. You may have an idea of what you wanna make, but you sort of play around with it until sooner or later, you sort of get something different. Right now this is a bit of a janky setup because I didn't have enough height to use the angle plate but I need a couple of degrees because the shoulder has to interlock a little. I just put a spacer under my rotary table. Let's try it out. All that done I think. I think I've got all the wear off there. The rounded shoulders are gone and hopefully that gives us a nicely angled drive face. Of course parts don't wear alone, they wear in pairs. So now I'm going to have to do the same job on its matching mate. You can see it's been done once before but it needs doing again because those shoulders are all rounded. Of course this part doesn't have the nice simple shoulders to hold it down. I guess I can go onto each of those three and just, just align the wheel so that it doesn't t hit those bits. Okay well after a lot of mucking around on this setup, getting that all nicely done, I've just realised it's not going to work because it's not going to clear the cup wheel here. So if that one's not going to work, how about a grinding disc? Now I will need to relieve the back edge of that 
disc a little so this comes off. Okay, well that's those rounded shoulders removed. I did gash one a little bit deep there. Just getting set up, I got a bit aggressive. Now luckily when I took this apart, I did have the foresight to make a video showing exactly how it goes back together. Unfortunately, that video disappeared in a hard drive failure about three years ago. Let's give this a quick wipe down. Peeking up out under here, it's like half a helicoil. So someone's obviously helicoiled this hole at some stage and they used a too long helicoil and did nothing to try and snap it off or cut it off. They're pretty brittle, I would assume you can just bash it with a cold chisel. It appears there's been two helicoils in there. Maybe I can cut that off with a cut-off wheel, little Dremel one. Well that worked, but I got out of sequence with my camera on, camera off button, so I've got no footage of it. Sorry about that. Now I'm pretty sure it all begins with the lay shaft bottom bearing. I bought all new bearings for it. And because it's got a, an enclosed oil system, I'll just take the inner seal off, turning a 2RS into a single RS okay. bearing. Now I'm going to leave that grease, it can wash itself out. I have washed the other ones, I did them before, but that can wash out in the first oil change. Oh wow, I just watched SpaceX's Starship and Super Heavy second launch. Wow, it sure went better than the now first one. The so next comes this gear. Right, this lay shaft needs two woodruff keys on it. This is the cam which drives the oil pump and the second one's driving that gear. Wait a minute. Still got some play. Bearing seated. What about that spacer? First disassembly. Oh look, when it's assembled wrong, you can pull the whole thing out and see where that spacer goes. Now, I need a puller. But my puller isn't sharp enough to get underneath. Pretty impressive to see how all 39 Raptor engines on the SpaceX Starship appear to have operated without failure. At some stage I really do need a press. Next up is the input shaft. It can also get its first bearing put on. Throw a bit of oil on those gears for the first meshing. Since the next bearing's fully inside the gearbox, it doesn't need any seals. Now I'm picking that the next piece of this puzzle needs to be the oil pump. It's this little plunger pump here. <laughs> Judging by the marks on those bolts, somebody didn't have a 7 16th socket in the past. Piers from the bends that this just sits over the top. I wonder if it's self-priming. There's a check valve here and here, so I should probably squirt some oil into it. OK, 
it does self prime that's good now the next thing to go on is the drive dog for the input shaft but i've just realized i can't find those two woodruff keys oh well what's this side job number seven well i'm really starting to get much faster at making these it's a grub screw which plays on that key so this needs tightening from the side here okay next up i guess i'll mount this one More new keys. Loop up the shifter shaft. Next, the matching gear. In one to one mode it's working normally all seems nice and smooth and easy but when I push it into back gear mode it locks up there's no problem with the one to one failing to disengage because that is disengaged in there that's fine ah now I see the problem When I made this shaft, I cut one of these in the wrong place. I guess it was this one, too far forward. But then I thought, well, because these two features are asymmetric, as long as I have one at the back for the rear feature and one further forward for the front feature, it'll work fine. However, if we look in here, the front edge of it's hitting locking up the gearbox. So the only real course of action I've got is to file off the front corner of this Woodruff key. Okay, now it clears. One to one. And back gear. Now it's not binding. Take that whole assembly back out. That I can mount this bearing. You idiot! Oh man, once again I was too hasty. There's a spacer which goes under there. And of course, my puller is too short, so I've had to make up some extensions for it. Let's hope this works. Yep. Sure enough, where I weakened it, it broke. I don't think there's enough space to get the good ends under it. I guess I'm done for today. Probably have to go out to my mate's place and use his press. Okay, it's now Sunday. I was working on this every day after work, all day Saturday. Had real push to try and get this finished and get a video up this week. Not gonna happen. I don't wanna put up another half finished video or a partially finished video. I want this thing working. I've left the place a complete pigsty, so let's do a bit of a clean up in between.
Franz has been playing around with his Toss cylindrical grinder and he's getting pretty good at it. Oh nice, a set of surface finish gauges huh? So if we take a look at one of your most recent ground parts, let's have a look, what, what are we going to call it? Somewhere between 3.2 and 6.3 or do you think it's 1.6? Do you just compare optically? Oh, okay, so you compare the feel with your fingernail. Gotcha. Yep, I'd also agree with you. It's, let's call it 1.6. Wow, now this is a pretty decent sized press. Ah, oh, there we go. Fantastic. Now we just need to throw that ring in. You know, I could have made up some sort of a setup to press this at home, but I figured if I come out to you, it may take me half an hour to drive here, but I know it'll work perfectly, <laughs> and it takes literally 20 seconds to get the job done. <laughs> 100 euro. <laughs> <laughs> Checks in the mail. I bought some of this gasket paper off Amazon, so I need to make up gaskets for each side of this. Okay, now the next attempt to get this assembled. Now me being me, there's a big temptation to just put the sealant on here, lock it up, install it and go, woohoo, I'm done. But let's be honest, that'll never work. So let's just do a trial fitter, see what it's uh, going to work like. Throw a couple of screws in. This was built back in the day when people still thought that big plain screws were a good idea. So one to one. In the low speed. Backwards it seems to turn. But forwards, hitting a binding right there. I'll throw the drive key on just to get a bit more leverage. Okay, it's a bit tight. Let's dress that up with a file. Okay, that resistance was just, I didn't put enough torque on it with my fingers. It seems to run fine. Well, with that now looking good, Nothing more for it but to seal it, seal it up, button it up, and leak test it. Now, I know this is not the proper way to open a flange, but I'm sure I'm not the first, and this goes pretty easily. This flange doesn't look great, but I've already stoned it down to take any burrs off it. I'm not exactly sure how Dual originally sealed this, but when I got it, it had been previously sealed with uh, something like Hylomar, so works for me, hopefully. We'll do a leg check and see whether it does actually work.
And yes, I am missing one screw. It's really quite a heavy beast. I'll have to go searching for some quarter inch UNC bolts and cap head screws. What? Oh, no, wait, I found one. Right, when I leak check it, I'll just throw a bunch of newspaper down. So if I come back tomorrow and it has leaked, hopefully the newspaper will. Soak it up. Well, I'll leave that overnight and we'll see if we've got a mess there tomorrow. And it's all dry, so no static leak. That's good. On the top here, there's this hole, which I'm assuming is just a breather. Left over from the Schauble pneumatics, I've got this little air filter, silencer. So I guess that's a good thing to close off a breathing hole, huh? I don't have the shifter mechanism to actually position this, so I'm going to have to make something. But I don't need that in place to test it. So I'll install it first, test it out, and then start thinking about my shifting system. And while it's sitting here on the bench, I can also install the drive pulley. I'll leave it there for now, I can still fine tune that once I've got the belt on it. You know, I was looking at a website by a guy called Doc from Doc's Machines and he had some pretty good uh, information on rebuilding a very similar machine to this. And you know what? I recognize this. This is the bracket which goes on here and forms part of that uh, shifting mechanism. Brilliant, that's one less part I need to make. Lucky this takes eight millimeter screws, both the one with the heli coil and the one without. It's loose, better tighten that up. I just need to lift that variator up a bit. While I'm in here, you can see why the chip blowing compressor doesn't actually blow any chips away. It's going to need some sort of an elbow on it because that tube's definitely too short. I already did this one. It didn't end up sleeving it, I just ended up uh, boring it out. Right, let's go all through the speed range. It's about as slow as it gets. Sounds like something funky is happening with the variator at the higher speed. Right now on high range. I 
Okay, so that nasty noise at the maximum speed is this pulley hitting on this uh, adjustment screw. And the weird oscillation at the bottom of travel is the whole motor fixture bouncing around. Okay, see down here? Okay, just looking down that key slot, you can see I'm just picking up a bit of a burr there. I think my Woodruff key slots in the new shaft I made are probably not quite as deep as the old one, so the key's sticking out further. I'll just deepen this keyway a little. So how's it looking? Well, we've got low gear. And we've got high gear. Right, here we go boys and girls. First test cut in a bit of six millimeter mild steel. Now according to the Cadron Selecteur, for a sea, uh, Utils, which I'm guessing is utility steel, so I'm going to say that's mild steel. Let's call it six millimeters. We want about a 14 TPI saw blade. Guess that's somewhat close. And we're looking for about 40 meters per minute of band speed. Okay, that was just the slight mishap that I wasn't quite engaged in gear. I was sort of between gears. Let's try that again. Oops. Well, sure is cutting nicely, but I think I jumped out of gear again. Okay, for six millimeter steel, I need about 14 teeth per inch. And in my boundless enthusiasm to see whether the gearbox works, I grabbed this blade and thought, yeah, that looks about right. Well, that was probably not such a good choice because I've just knocked a whole section of teeth off it. And measuring, it's actually more like maybe six teeth per inch. Can't blame the saw for that, that was my bad. I do have some finer blade material, but it doesn't work with these 3 8 of an inch thick uh, blade guides, which is the only set I've got. Watch for a future video where I make some blade guides. So next thing I need to do is start making the parts for the shifting mechanism. So the first part I'll start off with will be on the inside. I reached out to Doc of Doc's Machines fame. Because his website doesn't have a clear photo of the cam mechanism. I asked him if he could send me a photo and even better he sent me a dimension drawing straight away so thanks very much for that doc. Hey that's lucky. A 39 64th drill. That's exactly the size I was looking for. Right, gonna need to dial in some eccentricity here. Cam needs to be offset a quarter of an inch, so I need uh, half an inch of run out. Look. Then 
that's about 12.7 so that's fine okay now this is a pretty significant imbalance so it might take me a while to cut this down I'm going to need a lot of cuts so let's set the automatic kick out ramp for the power feed mechanism Right, I'll just check, check where that kicks out. You can see I've put a mark where I want to cut to, and I can just use the top slide to adjust to that mark. I mean, none of this is that critical. Well, that took a wee while. Now the next thing the design calls for is a bit of a sort of ball shape on the end of it. And I'll just do that manually. Doesn't need to be much. Right, now I'll just finish that off with a file. Right, well with that piece done, the next thing I need is the slotted matching part which mounts directly onto the gear change fork in the gearbox and gets driven backwards and forwards. Well, no point continuing with that tool path. I'm guessing that's six millimeters too short because I've got a six millimeter diameter wobbler. Probably a sign mistake, plus three instead of minus three. Right, let's take another shot at that. Well, this was an overly aggressive toolpath. I'm survived, the tool survived it. Chamfer looks like I set the tool a bit too deep, but just blend that out. Just put a stop on here to make sure I put it back in the vise in the same place. Now the other side. Now I wish I had some sort of saw, like a power saw, that I could cut this off with. Probably shouldn't have ruined that one bandsaw blade.
Okay, well that's the second to last piece made. Right, next up I need just to make a little crank handle. And since this piece of scrap's already got one of the holes in it which I need, I'll just chop it out of that. Okay, so there's my finished shifting mechanism, ready for installation. Put the little locking collar on the inside. Well, I've just spent a rather frustrating couple of hours playing around with this, adjusting the position of this. I've done a whole bunch of testing and I can't get the gearbox to stay in both high gear and low gear. To start with, it wouldn't stay in low gear. Because I don't know the original wall thickness of the original U-shaped part, I suspected I was putting the center line here in the wrong place. So I machined away bit by bit, and it did improve, but then it stopped improving. So I got out the Joe blocks to see if I could quantify where the problem actually lies. Most rearward position, let's try six millimeters. Well, after a bunch of contortionism and measurements, I've got three effects that are working against me. One, I don't think the cam has enough eccentricity. I'll bench check that. Two, a little bit of that eccentricity is lost because there's a bit of slop in the guide holes of that shifter shaft. And the third thing is I don't have the slot uh, located correctly. All right, measure this actual eccentricity, shall we? So there's my low point. Let's call that zero. So it's not quite the 12.7. It's about a millimeter too short by the looks of it more than a millimeter, it's showing 11.35, should be 12.7. Now the good news is I can use the gearbox as is, I just have to reach inside to change gear. Machining a new cam will fix the first and second issues I've got, and then I can shim the slot to hopefully get it to hold in both gears. But I will make a new shifter cam. Did a whole bunch of measurements, so it's just the way this saw was designed. I'd like to say a huge thank you to everybody who helped me out with this project, especially Luke and Emil, that was fantastic guys. It's fantastic to have this truly exceptional saw running like it's supposed to. Thanks for watching.